just to let you know that this session is going to be recorded um, and made available to other prospective students um, on YouTube. So if you um, don't want to be featured in the recording, um, please just keep your camera off and you can use the chat to ask any questions. Um, if you have any questions about this, um, you can just message me in the chat. Um, and we can also pause the recording if you'd like to ask a question um, at the end of the presentation um, with the recording switched off. So I hope that sounds okay, and I'll hand over um, to your program leads. Hello, good morning, at least good morning from London. And we would like to welcome you in our information event about our MSc in population health. My name is Henek Picard, and I am one of two co-leads for this program. Good morning, my name is Martin Bobek and I'm the second co-director of this MSc in Population Health. And our plan today is that we will talk for some maybe 10 minutes maximum and give a brief outline of our course and then there will be space for you and your questions because we think it's more important that you ask what you are interested in rather than we talk for most of the time. Hey Nick, we can't see you on camera is the only thing I'll uh, say before you start Hey, <laughs> Okay, apologies. So no, no, no worries at all. <laughs> um, so um, before we get into um, more academic part of the talk, um, just to tell you, which you probably know, that UCL is based in central London, which has its advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that it's easy for you to visit the British Museum and go to Euston train station and so on. The disadvantage is that the campus is scattered around quite a large area. So um, if you study with us, uh, you, will, you will know very well this part of central London. Uh, why to study at UCL? I think if you connected to us, you probably have some idea why to study with us. Um, the short answer is that UCL is one of the top 10 universities in the world. Depending on different rankings, you can see that uh, UCL is doing, doing very well in the UK research excellence framework. Uh, UCL ranked second in the UK, just after Oxford and before Cambridge. It's a research intensive university and our institute is a research intensive institute. Um, the internationally well-known researchers are teaching in, in our course. And uh, what we teach relates to real world problems, real research questions, so it's really anchored in, uh, in the real world. Uh, uh, this course is based in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, which is part of Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare, which is part of Faculty of Population Health Sciences. And um, most of uh, our teaching is delivered from, uh, from the staff based in the Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare and both Hinek and I in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. Um, so what, what we teach in the course? Well, firstly, the general idea is that we, we teach students who will become the leaders in population health in the future. And uh, we, we of, of course, teach how to measure and define population health. We are very strong in our interest in social determinants of health. Um, we deal with health policies and with various aspects of health systems in shaping population health. And we also pay attention to interventions which are designed to improve health of populations. The course itself um, is, as you probably know, we have a three terms and summer, which is for dissertation, 
and the the overall total of our teaching is 180 credits of which 60 credits are so-called core modules um, 60 credits are optional modules and 60 credits are counted by the dissertation the core modules are at the beginning of the course. So three of them are in term one and one is in term two. The optional modules are all in terms two and three. And the dissertation is, uh, is the main work for dissertation is done over the summer. The core modules are core concepts in population health and two methodological modules, basic statistics and epidemiology. And in term two, the, the last core module is key issues in health service delivery policy and management. Yeah. And as I said, there are four optional modules. And here is, I think, incomplete list of what is, what is on offer in, in this course. Um, one of them is term one, and the rest is term two and three. And you can see it ranges from health economics through advanced statistical modeling to, to uh, research methods and, and so on. So you see the list here. So the range is very wide and it's supposed to suit various interests of different students. Um, the assessment, I think, as in, as in other universities, it has a very very wide range of, of tools. Um, there are some exams with short and questions. Uh, some modules use essays. One of the modules is using a grant application as, as a tool for assessment, a critical appraisal. The basic statistics use data analysis report. Um, and there are several modules which use various, various uh, ways of presenting either individually or in groups or in pairs. So you can see that the assessment is not just one way of, of trying to examine students. There's a, there's a long range of options. Um, a dissertation accounts for one third of total credits. And uh, it's, it's a very important part of, of the course. And we generally support three formats of dissertation. One is a secondary data of secondary analysis of quantitative data or qualitative if they are available. The second most common format, or probably the most common format is systematic review of literature on a particular subject. And the final option, uh, if it is possible to arrange it is a primary data collection, but using qualitative methods because it requires small sample size and it's doable within the limited time which students have to collect the data. So these are the three formats of dissertation which, which we support. The dissertation topic is being selected sometimes in February, March, and uh, continues over the over the summer. Um, so you probably have been thinking whether this degree is suitable for you, and uh, we think that it is it is a very good course for people who are interested in making a change in the world. I mean, towards the positive change. If uh, for students who want to understand and discuss quite complex issues which relate to determin determinants of health and inequalities in health, and it's also it's also good for people who enjoy diverse student environment and uh, would like to become part of various networks related to population health. Um, a common question from uh, from applicants is what happens in the future with students who finish successfully this course. And uh, there is not one answer because there are very various futures of 
of our students. Many of them work in public health services. We have many people who ended up in either governmental or international organization departments dealing with health. Um, some students work for NGOs. We had students who ended up with either pharmaceutical companies or with health insurance companies. Um, academia, obviously, there's always students from the course who continue for PhD. So there's not one career pathway, um, but as far as we know, uh, students do very well after this course. So what you can expect, we, we believe our teaching is truly excellent. A lot of individual based uh, assessments, teaching, and so on. The curriculum is very closely related to our research and therefore it's based on real examples and real health problems. You can expect respectful, non judgmental, and supportive staff and students. It's, it's amazing opportunity to, to learn about population health and various aspects, how health is being changed, determined, intervened upon. Um, every student has a personal tutor. So there's a, a new CFS services which provide pastoral care. And what we expect from you basically 100% commitment to your studies, willingness to learn together with the staff. And uh, the feedback from our students has been very positive over the years. So we think that the course is really running smoothly and well, and it does what it's supposed to. And that's all from us. And now it's, the opportunity for you to ask questions and we will do our best to answer these questions. Thank you. Um, I think you can write the, the questions in the chat. So <clears throat> while you are thinking about questions, uh, we thought we may start with a few questions from uh, the past, from the previous open days, kind of common questions which uh, repeat every year. And one of them, I think, is about uh, types of study you can have with us. So we offer either full-time, part-time or flexible time type of study. Full time, it's obvious. It's full time. It's full time, <laughs> and it's uh, <clears throat> one year. The masters, as you know, probably in the UK, last one year, and it's really one year. It starts at the end of September. It finishes following September. So basically, no summer holidays because in the summer you should write your dissertation. Then we have two other types study or modes of study and these are quite often not clear how they are distinct so the part-time is clearly two years i think this is quite often uh, preferred by the uk students because kind of government loans are fixed only for those who study full-time or part-time but we also have option which is flexible time which is quite often used by people who are employed. And this is the study which may last up to five years. Basically, you choose every year as many teaching modules as you can, given you other commitments, your other work commitments. So if you plan to study longer than two years, you should go for the flexible type of study. If you think you will definitely finish in two years, you should go for part-time if you finish in one year, so full-time. So we now have three questions from, from you. So thank you. Um, the one question is, uh, is there any advice how to write a statement on the application? 
Um, I think you need to, well, you need to, you should, it's helpful if you demonstrate interest in the, in the subject. If you also show that you, you, rough, you re read the information about what the course is doing. We don't like very much the very generic statements, which obviously have been used for very different applications and they do not relate to, to us or to the, or to the contents of, of our course. And if you, if you can show that you are aware of a particular issue, question, problem related to the overall field of population and public health, that's always helpful. Hinek. I, I think uh, I will also read the second question because it's very much related. Should you have a research question you are interested in before applying? So if you have a research question which you are interested in, that's good. And it may help when you are trying to choose your topic for the dissertation. If you come, for example, with maybe some data set from your institution, from your country, if you've been working before coming to us, that's excellent. You can use such data set as a starting point for your research project, for your dissertation. Otherwise, if you don't have research question, for example, you come straight from your undergraduate studies, but it's not a problem, it's not a limitation. But I think what is really important is your general interest in improving health, general interest in population health, and coming to our department. And if you read about the background of what we do in the department as a research, I think social aspects of population health are really important because that's kind of underlying team which we have here in the department. It would loosely connect us to the third question. What is the profile of accepted students? Um, well, one thing is that our students come from very different walks of life. Generally, we have students who have either biomedical or biological or even medical background. But we have students who come from completely different backgrounds. Some we have students, successful students, who studied who had their first degrees in humanities or in some social science. So we do not have any particular requirement on, on your previous education and experience. Um, we have had people who had experience with work not only in public health, but generally you know, in, in having jobs. Every year we also have students who come directly after their, their first degree. So I don't think there's a, there is a definition of what are our successful applicants, except of course, you need to fulfill the requirements of the academic, uh, academic uh, on the marks and grades in your, in your first degree. While Martin was talking, I was thinking what are our probably largest groups of students. I think we have probably five large groups of students. We have some mm -hmm. students who studied biomedicine. We have quite substantial group of people who studied nursing. We have some people who studied medicine. And then we have people who studied psychology, and that's quite a common group. And then we have people who study social sciences. In addition to that, we have individuals from economy, health economy, people who studied some kind of management, health services. We have people who studied statistics and they try to move to health sector. So they have really very little biomedical background they are strong in numbers, but they don't have that other part of epidemiology or public health. So it's a mixture. It's a mixture, exactly. We had lawyers in the past. We had a couple of journalists in the past. So any discipline may is possible, but 
you must have interest in what you are going to study. Um, there's a final question at the moment. What is the class size? So in the last few years, the size of the course was around 50, between, I don't know, 45 and 52, something like that, depending if we count flexible and part-timers or if we look at uh, full-timers only. But this is this has been the size of the course in the last two or three years. So you, this this last sentence was important. It's course size, not class size. Mm. I think what we didn't say in our presentation was anything about kind of structure of individual sessions. And our sessions, it's a mix of lectures and practical classes. So in various modules, you may be in quite large lecture in a module which is only for our course, like the core concepts in population health, there will be no one else. So in the lecture, there will be between 40 and 50 students. You may be in lecture in the statistics and that lecture will be much larger, maybe between 150, 180 students. But what is important, every lecture is followed by practical classes. Yeah. And for these practical classes, you are divided to much smaller groups and there may be 25, 30 students with a couple of tutors. You may go to computer room after the statistics class and you will be in a relatively large computer room, maybe for 50 students, but there will be four tutors working with you at the same time. So we try for this kind of practical classes keep the staff student ratio really low because we believe these are the most important sessions of course you need lectures but i think these practical classes where you can discuss all the issues are very important um dear amalia asked about uh, how long it takes the application to be processed um Maybe we should say that UCL is a very large university and therefore your application first go to essential services before they are passed to us. But Hinek, what do you think is the average time? I think it, it, it really depends. We, we try to assess the applications in batches. So we don't go like one, one, one. So we try to see applications when there are maybe 10 or 20 together. So if you are lucky, the whole process may take six, seven weeks. If you are unlucky, it may take 10, 10 weeks. weeks. What is really important that you help the speed and how to help? I think when you apply, you are asked to put names and contacts of two referees try to inform your referees that you applied for this and you put their names there because they will get email so use really their emails which they use because ucl system will automatically send reference requests to the emails you have listed and the application will not move any farther until those two references are submitted. So quite often our students write to us, I have submitted my application six weeks ago, nothing is happening. It's quite often because they didn't inform their referees and the system still doesn't have one or two references. It will not move anywhere. So try to push your application in a way that you really actively inform your referees because only things start to move when the refer when the application is complete and just to add to this it is important that the referees respond from the professional institution email not from their private email because sometimes this causes problems don't use gmails don't use yahoo, yahoo emails for the referees it should be university email, it should be company email. I don't know, in our UK setting, it would be NHS email address 
things like that, these are fine. If you put as a referee someone with Gmail, the system will not like it because in a way you can write that reference yourself. So we would again delay the decisions. You would probably after several weeks get requests to put another different email address to that application, which is the professional address. There is a next question. Do you offer placement for this course? And placements are not really official part of, of the curriculum or, or the course. It is sometimes possible uh, based on individual interests from the staff and the students uh, that there can be some opportunities, but it's not an automatic um, part of it. Especially if you are a full-time student, there is no time for it. Mm. You will have classes from first week of October until uh, mid-June. And then you will have basically two and a half months to complete your summer project, your dissertation. There is really no time for placements. In many countries, masters takes two years and basically they cover the same amount of subjects, same amount of topics. So masters, UCL in our department is much more intensive. You will see in terms of number of classes, our students are quite often surprised that they are busier, much more busier than uh, when they did undergraduate degree. It's really intensive. It's, it's a very full course, a very good course, but because it's good, it also contains lots of, lots of material. I met yesterday with my duty and he, for himself, maybe I shouldn't say it, but he, he's auditing two modules in addition to three modules, which he's do, participating in actively. And he, he now notices that even auditing additional modules is something which is probably too much. It, it is very intensive course. And you have each module has one, two assessments. You will be required to write several essays during those first three terms. You may have several group presentations to prepare. So several PowerPoints to prepare. You may have one or two exams. So I think you will be busy really all 12 months. Um, while we wait for another question, maybe we should say that, um, uh, come back to the selection of modules. There is a large range of modules students can select as either optional or elective. And uh, at the beginning of the year, of the academic year in September, October, you will need to, to think hard what will be your path through the year and select the modules because this needs to be done pretty quickly at the beginning of the, of the year. So what we suggest is that you look at that list. Mm -hmm. And I think UCL has some kind of directory of all the modules. So you can look at some brief descriptions of each module. For those of you who will decide to study with us and who will register, I think UCL will invite you to choose modules sometimes very early in September before the course really starts. Usually it's not first come first serve. So please try not to make your definite selections before you come to the first week of the course, because during first week, we will introduce these modules in more details we will have discussions about module selection and you may see that you made wrong choices. And it's always more difficult to make changes than to make the first selection. So wait with your definite selection until you meet us, until you meet 
uh, the module leads and when you get more information. Um, there is a new question. Why the UCL program has a high rank and what does it make different from others? Um, well, we both with Hinek have been serving as external examiners on other courses in the UK or outside of UK. And while the contents of the courses are you know, more or less similar because statistic is statistics, epidemiology is epidemiology, I think the difference is twofold. First, the quality of teaching delivery, it's very good teaching. The teachers here are really, really good. And secondly, the fact that people teach what they are doing in their, in their work. If, you know, people who are doing research on social inequalities, they are really active researchers, public health doctors, policy makers, economists who deal with these issues. While in some other universities, you have three teachers who teach everything around a year. So I think a huge difference is the quality of delivery and the fact that you are really, well, not you, students are being taught by, uh, by, by people who have huge experience in the field. So there is a lot of, sorry, maybe coming back to statistics. Um, statistics cannot be taught just by reading a book. There needs to be a practice. And on the statistics, every lecture, every, every little bit of topic is followed by a practical sessions where you learn how to use appropriate software and you practice and practice. And even your assessment is a practical use of what you have learned. So I think that's maybe a third thing I can think of, but you know, guess more. I wanted to say that Martin said it's also true for the projects. In mm. some universities, you would get kind of artificial data or you would be asked maybe to reach to the population of students, design some kind of survey and do some analysis uh, on the data which you would collect from the students. That would probably show some of your statistical skills, maybe some of your writing skills, but you would have study which wouldn't be really useful for the public health, for the practice, because the sample would be not representative and so on. We don't do that here. You would get data which are real data from large studies, quite often studies that run for many, many years. You would get researcher as your supervisor who would be involved in such study and you would be doing a topic which has possibly potential to be published. Not every topic can be published, but every year, maybe quarter of dissertations get published in the real public health or general health journals. So there is really scope in doing something useful during your master year something which may have effect for your future career in public health or in the research. Uh, Mariana from Mexico is asking about collaboration or collaborations after the program. Hello, Mariana, my wife is Mexican, so it's nice to hear from somebody from Mexico. Um, yes, the hello. Um, the most obvious way of collaborations longer term collaborations is a phd if you know if there is a project of mutual interest between the staff here at ucl and the student um and and if there's funding then uh, you know as i said before every year several students do phd with us for the future um, and they are there are scopes for collaborations because if the student is having a good question or opportunity or works in a, in a strategic institution in different country and a member of staff is working on something similar and is interested, yes, there are scopes for collaborations. It's very difficult to say now 
before you know before you start um, studying at UCL. But we we've had we've had long term collaborations with people who who did masters with us. You ask whether the PhD can be done by distance. I think you are probably asking not the right people because we do not know exactly full kind of uh, regulations. But what, as far as I know, distance based PhD is not possible. I think some kind of hybrid where you would spend part of the time here and part of the time in your home country is possible, but I think you would need to spend some time uh, at uh, UCL. And I would say some time, it's not a few weeks. I think it's a relatively substantial part of the time. Especially in the first year. Um, I think we will not get into details of regulations for PhD. But I think there, there is probably at least half a year in year one, I think, which need to be spent at you in London. But like this master's in population health cannot be done distance based. You must be placed here in London and you must attend classes. Then you probably need to do similar thing for the for, for distance based PhD, you miss the COVID pandemic. Can you think of any other questions? I think one thing which we should say before we finish, if you haven't applied yet, and if you plan to apply, do it as quickly as possible. I think every year, I think we are oversubscribed. And UCL wants us to close the applications relatively early. I think uh, Alison may know better than we are. But yeah, I think it's either end of March or end of April. End of March, yes, end of March. Yep, 30th. So you have basically two months, two months to apply. After that, it will not be administratively possible. And uh, before that, we also have number of offers which we can give. So if we fill our spaces before, we we need to close earlier. I think we try to keep some places until the last moment. So it is likely that if you apply on the 25th of March, we will still consider you. But if you apply after end of March, basically you will not apply because I think the system will close and you will not be allowed to yeah. put your application to the system. So think relatively quickly. I don't know whether you um, saw it, Nick and Martin, but there was just one other question from Mariana. Um, what would you say is the most decisive part um, for acceptance? in the application, so decisive part in the, the application. First, the first hurdle, I think, is to have the required academic grade from the previous degree. Because if the if the if your degree does not have the required grade, it's very unlikely you will be you will make it through. And the second point is good references, obviously and a good statement, which we discussed earlier today. Good degree. I don't know how familiar you, any of you are with the UK classification system, but the, there is some kind of um, possibility to transform degree in every country to classification, which you would get in the UK. And you need basically equivalent to upper second uh, grade from the UK university. So I think you are probably able to find on the internet what you need to get from your university to be able to apply. But basically, if you don't have equivalent of upper second, you wouldn't be considered 
mm -hmm. this and we wouldn't see basically the application it would be rejected without us looking into the personal statements i think second for the people who have different first language than english you will also need language test yeah. and i think ucl accepts all kinds of the tests but i think most typical is ielts and then i think tefl is the mm. second most common yeah. so you will need to look at the ucl requirements and pass this test you can get accepted provisionally or conditionally accepted while you still don't have that test so you may apply now and do the test in june you will if we like your application we will suggest ucl to give you f offer and ucl would give you conditional offer so you have until september to pass language test so language test is not barrier now when you are applying it would be barrier not to start the course but otherwise i agree with martin for us as admission tutors personal statement is the most important Okay, so we think if there are no more questions, and we talked for a long time, but you asked nicely, that's nice. Uh, we'll probably finish this uh, this Zoom call. Alison, what do you think? Yes, no, that sounds great. And um, I dropped a link to the prospectus page. It has the um, email address for the administration team for the yes uh, for the MSc population yeah. help. So anyone remembers any extra question in the next few hours, mm -hmm. we have another run, another call for people from other parts of the world at four o'clock in the afternoon of UK time. So if you have any other urgent question, you can come at four and ask your other questions. Perfect. Amazing. Thank you so much, um, Martin okay. and Nick. That was great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.